I'm on live. Hi, everyone. Uh, if anyone can hear me, if you can just uh, pop a comment, that'd be awesome. Hey, Lauren. Good to see you. And uh, thanks for the tip, Kuba. Um, I might be over 50, but I can actually multitask and read the comments as well. So uh, all good. So uh, I should say uh, just to give a few people some time. Uh, kia ora and uh, hope everyone is uh, is doing well during this uh, global pandemic. We talk about uh, evolving in industry. Hey, Pascal. Um, who would have thought that a global pandemic would be affecting our industry as well? So uh, big times here and around the world. Hi, Annette. It's, um, we talk about leadership as well. And um, yeah, thanks, Grum. It's called being over 50, you need glasses. Um, talking about the pandemic and leaders, you know, it's a, we're very lucky in New Zealand. Doesn't matter what uh, political party you support, but uh, I have to say in uh, times like now, we're fairly grateful for our PM, uh, Jacinda Ardern. So it's all good here. Just give a few more people a time and then we'll um, get into it. Um, just make sure at any time, uh, do feel free to comment. As I say, I can uh, see them. Um, if you've got any questions or stuff, uh, put them in and um, we'll get to them at the end or partway through. But um, all is good. As well. Okay. Sit here. All right. I'll just start off a, a little bit. Firstly, um, going in um, just to, as to how I got into the industry. Probably the big step for me was being a paddy instructor. Um, and uh, I ended up teaching for 10 years, six years full time. But a couple of things that it really taught me. Firstly, as a paddy dive master, I had a leadership role. But the big part was, as a paddy dive master, you have a leadership role, but really you don't have the responsibility. That responsibility fell over towards a, the instructor. So they had that responsibility. So that was a big thing that I knew going into the expedition industry, going from an expedition team member over to an expedition leader. The other thing that the um, dive industry taught me was as an IDC staff instructor, uh, that's where I got to assist a course director, which was teaching dive masters to be instructors. It didn't matter what experience they came in, whether they had the minimum amount of quali uh, qualifications to go on to do their instructor, everyone bought something of value. And it uh, was things that I could pull in with uh, my teaching and build always keep building on as an instructor myself. So it was a big stepping stone for me. And when I got the opportunity to come into the um, expedition industry, that was the big thing. I knew I wanted to be a team member for as long as I could, because once again, even though our expedition teams uh, consist of a lot of leaders, ultimately you don't have that overall responsibility. Kayak guides, yes, of course you've got responsibility with um, your kayakers. Same with mountain guides. If you're the camp master, you have responsibility, but the ultimate responsibility will always come down to the expedition leader. So you're responsible for overseeing the product delivery in a safe manner. That's super, super important. You're gonna be overlooking the expedition team, uh, depending on the structure. Um, of your company, you're going to be liaising with the captain, you're going to be liaising with your own leadership team, the hotel managers, um, head office, and uh, sometimes you're going to be facilitating uh, training. When we're talking exponential growth in this expedition cruise industry in polar regions, the theme comes up, cold is the new hot. And what we're seeing now, we're seeing 
longer seasons. We're seeing more ships. We're seeing new ships. We're seeing larger vessels. And then, of course, with that, a larger expedition teams. Those are kind of the points that I'm going to focus a little bit on as we go through this. Um, but I also acknowledge that there's other things that have changed. Uh, language groups, uh, the amount of adventure options that are going, um, the varying ice ratings of vessels, um, experience of the bridge teams. Uh, we're now encouraged to use different platforms to, you know, deliver our products, um, you know, finding new sites, uh, fly crews versus conventional voyages. There's all those other things as well. But as I say, we'll go back to the longer season, more vessels, larger vessels, new vessels, and the end result is larger expedition teams. So 200 passenger vessels are kind of now the norm, and I'm talking a lot more about the Antarctic because there's obviously a lot more people who work down there just to kind of um, bring in some relationship to everyone there. But we have the varied itineraries, the links, the options. Expedition teams are now anywhere from 20 to 30 staff. When I went, when I first started, I didn't have the luck of, of working on the smaller, six, you know, 50, 60 passenger vessels, but I had a team of 12. Handling a team of 12 to 30 is, is very different. And your staff, as you know, have a huge, um, varied level of experience. Their contract lengths are varied, and you have cases where some of the staff work for more, more than one company, and you're going to have a lot of team changes. Uh, so constantly changing teams all the time. I'm sure some of you are fairly familiar with, I know this is a big thing that's, um, that uh, we talk about in PTGA. Um, I've been fortunate enough to have some sessions with Dave Ritchie. Great talk the other day, Dave. Um, but this is Hershey and Blanchard's situational leadership model. Now, I don't know how many of you have actually seen it before, um, but it's something that you should get familiar with. And if you're a PTGA member, um, it's available online in leadership courses. But basically, in essence, what it's telling you is there isn't one style uh, of leadership that's suitable for all guides. And when we talk leadership, versus being a leader. Remember, a leader is someone who's going to command a group. When you're talking about leadership, that's the art where you're going to try and motivate a group of people and you're acting towards a common goal. So as you know, you're going to have to, as um, a leader, you're going to have to adapt uh, some of the your leadership styles based on the individual skills and attitude. When you're looking at this model, you've got two areas. You've got what we call directive behavior, and this is giving you one-way communication. So if you think about inexperienced guides, this is where they, you're going to basically, you're going to tell them what to do, and they're going to appreciate that. If you try that kind of style with someone who's uh, more experienced, they're going to be a little bit uh, resistant. They're going to feel like they're going to be micromanaged. Then you have to step over for them you're going to be looking at more of this kind of supportive behavior so that's that two-way communication so you can imagine on a team of 30 you're going to have to work out uh, what you are actually going to use uh, on each individual which as you can imagine can be a little bit testing and of course then as it goes through the whole season you can remember that the guides are going to evolve and then you're going to have to change as well. If you even think of the aspect of um, your in-house training, a lot of companies now we're looking at in-house training. Um, trainers can actually look at the supportive behavior, this two-way conversation uh, with ELs to, um, to work through. Uh, we all operate similarly as ELs, but of course differently. And the trainers have opportunities to work with all the staff. So uh, thinking quite simply, if you're, a, if uh, say, if someone's working with me, these are some of the expectations I have. If you are approaching a landing in a zodiac, um, what I want you to do is I want you to look and see if the shore team are ready to receive you. And if they're not, just come in slowly, fill in the time, have that kind of situational awareness. 
always take your zodiac off a plane early so you don't create a wake and position your guests towards the back of the zodiac if it's a beach landing those are kind of some simple things of like how i op i like to operate and it's an example that as a trainer you can use that two-way um, communication with that supportive behavior to try and build that into some of your training sessions um, if you have, um, if we're talking about, um, uh, sorry, uh, going back to the training, um, one of the things that's been a great advantage that I've had in the last couple of seasons is uh, being very fortunate where ELs actually get to hand over. So we get a, a voyage as a staff member and then also uh, before we jump into the role, and this is a great opportunity uh, that we need to make count because we can see how a team is actually working knowing that we could still have some changes as the industry involves um, i recognize that the need uh, to evolve with it as an el and this is uh, as a el as a guide we should all aim to be better better guides after all, this is what I choose as my profession, and I think that's what we need to look at it. It is a profession, and it's your chosen profession as well. At the end of the season, I always like to reflect on what went well, and you can easily get that from guest feedback. But I also like to look at how I can prove, uh, improve as a leader in regards to leadership. And this season for me, one word kept repeating itself and that was the the word expectations and when you think of expectations for me it's like a strong i have a strong belief something will happen or it could be the case and and this got me thinking because as i say more and more people are coming in some of my questions were are my expectations of the team realistic and these expectations how should i actually communicate these expectations to the team um, the other one was should all els within the company have similar expectations or the same expectations that apply during the season and that's going back to the the length of the season that we now have the number of els that will work through the season some of the seasons i mean it's october through to I think the last ships uh, finished around April this year. So it's a really long, long season. And while I was thinking about that, I brought up, um, I ended up with four words, uh, with four words, six words beginning with P. The, the first one is purpose. And um, any comments you have um, during this, uh, please do fire away. But the purpose is why, why, why are we here? Why is going to show us the purpose, I should say, is going to show us that kind of motivation and the inspiration. And uh, just so you know, money shouldn't be one of those. Um, you know, the purpose, could it be uh, to share and be part of the most pristine wilderness area on earth with the opportunity to ignite and appreciate an understanding of our, our planet? Or should that purpose be, and this is one I actually had this season, I want to return next season, as this is one of the easiest jobs I had. Which purpose do you think is the one? Who would you want to have on your team? Another one that I, I jumped for was uh, prepare um, to empower yourself. Pre-season making sure that you're familiar with uh, FOMs, looking at the latest research, uh, personal equipment, what do you have? Um, some of us have GPS, some rely on getting it from the, the companies. Uh, do we prepare briefings based on new information, uh, site regulations, uh, recaps based on new findings? Um, you know, preparation can also be as you're approaching a site, it doesn't matter how many times I've gone into Paradise Bay, I'm always on the bridge uh, before we enter. And what I try and do is I'm, I'm having a look. If I'm going to do a Zodiac cruise, I'm looking at what I can see, conditions, um, where I might 
um, take my Zodiac cruise? Uh, is my short, is my kit ready? Um, so preparation, empowering yourself. And that jumps into mine. It's like one another little quote that I have is failing to prepare is pe preparing to fail. Have you got a passion? Um, working in the Antarctic, um, it used to be around 10,000 people a year when I first started. It's over 70,000 now. The passion, there was like a blood sport. Um, you know, you were desperate. Um, well, I can just see some more things coming in. Um, sorry. Yeah. Hey, P and everyone. I've just got to scroll as I go. Um, you know, passion, as I say, it was a blood sport. You wanted to get to some of these less, lesser known destinations. Um, uh, you know, looking at um, having a, a passion for the destination, a passion for your role or position with the team. It might also be a passion for a role you aspire to have. Hey, Marika. Um, also, the company you work for. Um, it could be taking on something like a citizen science project as well. Um, all of those things. Uh, it'd be a uh, <laughs> good one. Uh, Ben's just saying he likes the peas. I, I bet he does. Um, but, um, you know, that same passion, the same passion some of you have to go to the sauna, uh, same passion for the gym, a nap. Um, or the bar. So, you know, that passion has to be there as well. Another one, professional. When you're looking at what does a professional guide look like? Um, how do they conduct themselves? What are the impressions that you give off? Um, simple things, smart appearance, um, you know, professional guide. You're going to have some bios, getting back into your basic kit that you should have, uh, binos that you should have. You might have your own GPS, safety knife. Again, companies supply a lot of stuff, but when it comes to GPS, um, for me personally, I want to know uh, that mine is reliable, I'm familiar with it. Um, same with uh, my radio, same thing, each to their own, going back. It's a profession, we choose to do this. Um, you might have, if you're old school books, if you're, you're uh, more up with it, um, apps on your phone. Um, everyone uses iSailor, um, you know, Antarctic wildlife guides, all kinds of things as well. So um, another thing, uh, s seeing this here, old historical photos. And while you're out, um, out in the Zodiac cruises, holding that up, taking a photo of the existing. So. Uh, Good kudos there, uh, Sandra. Thanks for that little tip uh, in uh, here as well. You know, for those of you who've been off to safaris in South Africa, you know, it's an old safari vehicle versus a, um, you know, in a versus a new one with the guide, the guide who looks presentable. Um, <laughs> oh, I've got a confession. <laughs> oh, okay, I'll look at that thing. Um, you know, the way you presented, they have new binos. They might store their rifle properly. Um, they might have blankets, vests if it's going to be, um, you know, uh, cold, etc. So think about your presentation, professionalism, how you look, how you appear, your first impressions. The other thing that we're looking at too is um, being proactive. Um, and uh, just jumping in, Grum. No, I don't want it to be an executive admin role. I think um, we'll go here. I'm going to talk a little bit more um, about uh, a role I see as the EL carrying on. Um, but being proactive, being proactive, um, these are the things that you want the staff to do. You want to, you want to be bringing some motivation. Between landings, if you've got a, a landing cancelled, Think of how you can add to that guest experience by going to the bridge or the outer decks or hanging out in the lounge or the library without being asked. Um, take an opportunity, build on some existing knowledge, learn from other staff, um, more experienced staff. Take that opportunity to upskill. Um, there's many ways you can do that. Not tying, as you know, or not sessions. Uh, bird watching with the orn ornithologist. I, and I hate to admit it, um, but I have got into a bit of backyard birding, birding here during lockdown. Um, I'm not sure how long it'll go on, but uh, 
um, you know, you can learn more about that. It might be a, a, some time to, to jump on and uh, go through the shortcut, uh, the medical shortcut with your medical emergency response team leader. Um, all of these are examples of self-directed learning where you can take charge of your own development. Um, but remembering that this shouldn't actually um, affect your role within the team. All right, you should still know you're, you're there, you're part of the team, you've got a role to fulfill. The self-directed learning, you need to, to make sure it's, um, you know, done during the appropriate time. Yeah, good point, um, Helen, about being fully familiar with uh, medical emergency response kits, etc. cetera. Um, and the other one is P, uh, P in our P department, a privilege, you know, it's a real privilege to be uh, going to these destinations. Um, and it's a privilege to be able to share this with the people that turn up there. So they're a huge part of what we're doing. So um, just looking at some of these comments coming in through here, um, as I say, it's, um, do you think these are realistic expectations you should have of, um, staff you know part of your expedition teams do you think they should have a purpose they should prepare they should have passion um professional impression uh, you know be professional on all sorts of levels be proactive um all of that kind of stuff and no pam none of those p's are for you <laughs> as well thanks for the comment Guys, it's making me have a little bit of a giggle, and I just need to have a little bit of a baby. Mm. Um, of course, expectations are going to vary from company to company, from individual operations, and within teams. Um, and know that your companies are going to have expectations for you, um, as with a you know, as an expedition leader, if you're in that role or part of the um, senior um, team, that uh, you'll have to fulfil those of the you know yourself, the company, the staff, um, but also captain and crew. But knowing that that's there, but as I say, we'll just leave that to the side because I don't want to go on too long here. The other part to look at. Um, and just have kind of in the back of the mind. And again, I'm um, touching, touching on um, a few little aspects. I mean, a lot of these could be individual presentations on their own, but teaming is another one. And, and basically your definition, teaming, what is teaming? Team, teamwork on the fly. Hey, Jumper. Um, team changes uh, can be frequent. Now, and that's what's, what I'm saying is like you've got large teams, you've got longer seasons, they're going to be going, changing all the time. And that's where you have to be able to help uh, help the teams form, form and reform. So that gives you some more challenges. Um, your team, how can you facilitate, um, you know, uh, getting everyone to know one another? How do you discover their... Uh, strength and weaknesses, how can you help develop personal ties or common understandings? Just having a quick read of uh, here. How do, uh, here's a good one. Um, P's going, how do EL stay grounded with being a staff member within a team if you're always hired as EL? How do you remember how it is to be a staff member, not an EL? Good question, and I'll jump to that very shortly. I've got that. P um, got that for you. Um, what I actually do um, do often and did this season. Um, so here you go. Is you know we're talking about the team changes um, and building um, as far as teaming. For me, a big change in my leadership and growing where I really started to be challenged was going from a hundred passenger vessel to a two hundred passenger vessel. Um, and when I was doing that. Having a team of 12 with only two to three new people each season and a core team, uh, really experienced staff, a uh, team that knew each other well, had been working together, we got together over um, five seasons. Um, you know, you get into this mode where you support each other, you work well, you know how to make it work and the results came. But that's really rare now with 200 people. Um, 
200 people, you can look at 26 staff. You can have, you know, 50% of your staff new each season. Um, you're doing multiple things. You're, you've been landing, you're zodiac cruising, you're going to ski, you can climb, you can camp, kayaks up. That was the big change for me. And that was where the big challenges came and where I really found it um, a big learning curve in trying to manage a bigger team. Some of the things that I found that are really good um, to be able to do is uh, to help build teams with that teaming is where I can is finding out with um, staff uh, who likes to room together. I know a lot of staff like to be, if you can have your own cabins uh, and get that, you like that. But who rooms together, who can be a good mentor, who's going to look out after each other and know uh, when things are happening on a personal level. Uh, who's going to look after them and uh, that's all important for well-being because that's a big part um, of looking after your team as well is the well-being and, and knowing what's going on because we do all have things that go on outside of our little uh, ship bubble to use a little uh, terminology appropriate for the time at the moment. Um, you can do simple things. Um, I know we have uh, company requests but you know we should dine every night to me, that's big. Less, sometimes less is more. Having half the staff die one night and the other half the next night, because you've got that time where some of the staff can just have dinner relaxed. That also helps with teaming as well. Um, a yeah, good point, uh, point Dimitri, is, is talking about, um, um, you know, on the bigger vessels, uh, tending to lose expedition spirit and as I say you guys have got all, all good comments that are relative to the companies you're working with at the moment and their direction um, and a really important part um, that we need to communicate as an EL is to, to make sure staff need to understand their role within the team and how it can impact um, their actions can impact on the rest of the team. As we know polar operations um, can be complex. Um, this can be due to weather, it can be unexpected uh, events that require a rapid change in course. And we talk about situational leadership and we were just talking um, about, um, yeah, good point Grum, um, we were talking about, you know, uh, going back to our um, directive behaviour and supportive behaviour. i just give you one one quick example to throw in and how things had to change rapidly. Um, Coverville Island, I don't know how many people have had adiabatic winds there. I think I've had them twice in approximately 18 seasons. But um, Coverville, basically calm. Um, 15, uh, and the winds went from calm to 50 knots within uh, less than 10 minutes. When that occurred, we were doing a 200 passenger vessel landing, zodiac cruise. Um, we had uh, climbers climbing up the, the steep base of Coverville. We had kayakers. We had a penguinologist on Ronji. Um, and uh, on top of that, the ship began to drag anchor, and control of the engines was lost from the bridge. When we talk about teaming and knowing strength and weaknesses, this was a time of situational leadership um, where I had to be directive. And part of the team, is, as an EL, you need to be part of that team as well to know strengths and weaknesses. I was straight into a directive mode because I had no time to consult, um, consult with anyone. And that, because of that team process and knowing those strengths and weaknesses, made my decision making really, really easy. Um, and as I say, everyone got off, it was all good, but that potentially could have been uh, quite a disaster, especially when we lost control on the bridge. Um, it's also important, um, uh, yep, just having a quick read of Vicka's comment as well. Yeah, yep, great, as I say, great comments coming Thanks, guys. Um, it's also important to understand the various roles um, and uh, that you're familiar to on new vessels. Um, and this is going back to P. 
one of the big things that I did um, this season, and I always try to do often, um, is, uh, is make sure I assign myself into all sorts of positions so I can see how things are work, uh, working. I go in as an EL, I'll, I'll do disembarkation. I did gangway ups, I'll set up a landing site, uh, drive the zodiacs. Um, I'll also, uh, I also assign myself to do check-in, uh, overseeing the boot wash, um, even assisted with launching and retrieving of um, zodiacs and kayaks. Yeah, got that, Peter, thanks. <laughs> um, so that's when you're talking about how do you stay grounded. It's like these are the things that I did. I make myself really familiar with the operations on board and also um, that way I can get an understanding of what the staff are all doing and um, where you have time um, to be able to maybe go and take some opportunities to go off and do something self-directed learning based on those positions but I think it's really really important uh, as an EL that, that you keep your your um, keep yourself with that and do all of those um, uh, jobs. A big part of um, as an EL and this is a real focus now with a lot of new people coming into the industry we all knew at some stage and I think that's something that you never should lose sight of we all had to learn um, at some point but it's important to try and uh, create learning opportunities um, but you need to create the right environment and this is again something that I need to uh, to look at um, I keep wanting to work on um, and it's a new thing that was introduced last year to me and that's to include um, psychological safety and what that is is a, is knowing that anyone on the team is not going to be punished or humiliated if you speak up with different Ideas, if you have questions, if you've got concerns or mistakes. So, you know, if you're talking, if you're planning an excursion or reviewing a landing operation um, or you've had an incident, that everyone feels that we can come together and we can talk and share, share these, um, you know, share your ideas or ask questions um, as well. You know, there's no such thing as a stupid uh, question. And this is really going. Once again, make yourself uh, familiar with it, guys. If you haven't ever looked at it or learned about it, um, what you're doing with psychological safety, uh, Amy Edmondson, um, she uh, does a, a great TED talk on it. Um, but basically, you can see you've got two axes here. You've got here um, motivation and accountability. And then here, your psychological safety here is. Um, Cut the side. If you've got high in both areas, you're in a fantastic learning zone. So, um, what you want to do is you want to try, um, for example, if you're going to perform a crevasse rescue, use that as a learning experience. Um, and you can, as you've got someone leading it through, you can talk about the questions, everyone can learn. As a leader, I can't do that. Be the person who rigs the pulley system and pulls someone out. You're going to be familiar with it. Um, no, I didn't. I didn't laminate the slide, um, Sandra, just so you know. Um, just had to reply to that. Um, but um, I'm aware of it. I know how it is. I've seen it. I've been part of it. But that's not something I can do. So it's really important as a leader that you um, add your fallibility as well. I, you can't know everything as a leader, all right? And the big thing too is we demonstrate curiosity. So, so this is where, you know, in my situation, I would ask questions, who's got experience in this area, blah, 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 you know? Um, who can rig up a pulley system and that's how you build this whole learning process together. Um, you create an environment, that's going to tolerate a degree of mistakes, but at the same time, you want to tolerate repeated mistakes. That's the that's what you're getting to. Um, and I'll just do a quick more because I don't want to go too too long. Um, oh, I said I was going to do 25, but I've already gone too long, so sorry about that, team. Um, but uh, 
uh, some of the the things that you can do. Um, yeah, things are really tough over the hill, Grum. Um, as far as creating and leadership opportunities within your realms of operations, um, one that I got from uh, Ben Jackson um, using that acronym WETAP. Um, this is an excursion assessment that can be done individually or as a team. Um, and what I'm trying to do is uh, build a shared purpose or a vision. And WETAP just literally means assess the weather. Right, so you're having a look at the weather. Um, you know, is it windy, ice, whatever? Uh, equipment, what equipment do you need? Is there something you need? Is it, you know, are you zodiac cruising? Are you doing a landing? What shore equipment do you need to take? Looking at the terrain, assessing the terrain. What activities are you doing? Um, looking at the people, um, you know, with your team, and of course, and then purpose is a, a great little thing tool that he's uh, created and uh, who knows he might share it with you uh, as well but I'll leave that to him um, again you can have you can give someone um, a chance to uh, be the beach master land manage the land and plan effective operation could be a 200 passenger vessel um, how can you make that an effective turn uh, leading a hike plan with an experience guide um, and then execute Again, these are some opportunities you can create for those who have less experience want to grow. Again, that's self-directed learning. Um, conducting shore briefings from the Zodiac with the guests before bringing them on. Um, work with your, you know, again, your expedition leader or the leaders in the team. You know, um, I'm lucky enough to work with, uh, I think, four expeditions on the team. So you can actually... Um, each other with that learning as well. Same thing going back to Colby's, you know, the recapping, challenge yourself to reinvent um, the recap, introduce conservation stewardship, uh, make it positive, fun, engage in what is happening at the moment, build on the experiences, and so on and so on. Um, one of the key things that I think is great is staff led sessions. So um, creating an opportunity for staff to be a lead. It could be something practical. Let's go back simple. Leading a knot tying session. It could be educational. It could be increasing your knowledge. I never get geology. I could go and attend 55 million of those and I still don't get it. But it could be educational or it could be sharing a personal experience. All of these help um, getting to know each other, that teaming process, building on it. Um, and knowing, as I say, um, where each other's strengths are and uh, what you can do. Um, I've gone on, there's um, a lot of things that I've kind of touched on and I hope it makes some, it makes a bit of sense and that there has been a lot of um, value in it. Um, all of this is part of actually, again, going forward to setting a culture um, and a culture is where you can recognize good things. You can motivate um, and thank your team. And, that's another part that we need to try and work on as leaders and build because again it's all bringing that um, that team together um, I always like to have what I call little nuggets um, and a way of thanking team is um, you know if you get the chance send them out kayaking um, it might be um, you know on a landing where your kayak guides are normally out hiking they can't go on, but sending them on a um, uh, to a site where they can go and about it from a different perspective, like going for a, um, a uh, um, hike at Salisbury Park, and like that, if you happen to be in South G. Um, or allocating people to have a morning or afternoon off just to utilise they wish. Again, um, looking after being, making sure people are healthy, um, but giving people some personal and down. I think that's a really, really important part. And um, and all these things that you do, um, will come back to you as a leader in the performance of the team. Um, I'm going to go through some comments here um, uh, quickly and acknowledge some of those, but I'll uh, just leave you with this for the moment um, before I read those. Um, ben uh, Jackson, who um, 
I'm pretty sure is, uh, he's listening at the moment. Firstly, uh, Ben, happy birthday. Um, he's celebrating today. Uh, but he sent me a quote, and it said, um, it doesn't matter how much experience people have if they're not determined to get better. It doesn't matter how much talent people have if they don't use it to make others better. Let's bet on the who are driven to improve their teams and themselves. So uh, um, I think that's a really a good one. So I'll just um, leave it at that for a minute. I'll have a, a quick, um, quick look and go. Cheers, Shaz. Uh, our kayaking, uh, kayaking um, thank you is etched in my memory. One of the best things I've done. Michael, um, yep, what I find useful as a team member is having a celebrate team meetings when go well. Absolutely. Yep, and we always do that. Yep, it's a, a good point to do. And um, it's good if you can vary as well, um, time and place. Uh, Grum's mentioned here, Colby's material will be pushed as guides. It's all good. Uh, Graham, things over the hill. Sandra, awesome. Yeah, true, true. Yep, Marika, good point. Uh, transparent, I think, is important to building that trust. Uh, yep, uh, be open, honest, humble, and yourself. Peter, yep, going back, gain trust, earning trust. Um, gaining trust is, for a leader is vital. Yep, for challenging situations. Points, both uh, of you. Um, Yep, again, some good comments going through. Yeah, do, 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 talking about, I think that's all. P, I got yours. Yeah. Jump up. One, do, do, do. And Dimitri, yeah, about IATO offline as well. Yeah, I think that's, uh, hopefully I haven't um, missed anything too much. Um, comments for everyone, you can read and build on. Um, and again, um, perfect. Uh, oh, Laura, i got here. Da, da. Can you talk about your own transition from Guide to EL? Did you feel prepared to start leading? Uh, yeah, to answer that one um, run quickly, yeah, um, yes, and it was purely uh, number one, having leadership from the dive industry, being a dive instructor, having my skipper's ticket, being responsible for that. So um, that responsibility and that leadership um, was part and parcel um, of it. And yes, a lot of the skills of good leadership are um, yes, I do have things that uh, definitely challenge and challenge me. It's, you make mistakes, um, but hopefully you have support and grow, and it's to build. Uh, that's one of the big thing. It's everyone makes mistakes. Um, we all want to be better, but it's having how that is communicated to you. And as I say, that's kind of thing that I'm looking at. Um, for me, I think. Um, I'll be honest here, um, as a, subtle as a sledgehammer is sometimes uh, how my family described me and it's definitely something um, I have to work on as well. So some of the tools that you can use, um, leadership's kind of ingrained a bit and uh, but there's definitely things that can help you develop and particularly at the moment now um, as industry is evolving in size, etc., of ships and teams, and that you need to bring in a whole lot more tools. So now it's growing, that's where I'm challenged more, and things I have to change and grow personally myself. Um, WETAP is, is, yep, there we go. Uh, thanks, Ben, for sharing that. Good one. Hope, hope it all, uh, starts uh, going. Um, well for our ships and who knows what our 
this is going into right now. Um, I think the most important thing right now is let's all stay safe, stay healthy, um, get this beat, and then um, hopefully the world is a better place for having um, for the time that we've got to reflect. Uh, always no time to say good words to each other. Okay, guys, thanks very much. Um, sorry it went on a little bit longer, and I'm happy to, t um, you know, any questions personally, um, you can message me. Um, as I say, enjoy. Okay.